I love the book of John. John is, is one of my most favorite writers in the Bible. Um, and, and he is the classic Jewish author. Um, we read stories like this, and at first they seem very simple. Um, they go through a, a slight progression, and, and John's a good storyteller. But, as it is with most classic Jewish writers, there's always something underneath that we don't always catch the first time around. Um, and when I, I got this scripture this week, and I started doing a little research and studying, a bunch of new things came out to me, um, which I just absolutely love. I get really excited when, and I know that sounds strange to some of you, but I get really excited reading some of these verses and finding all this new stuff. Um, so, let me tell you a little story first. I, I know this girl. She's probably about 12 or 13 years old. Um, and she lives in a state of perpetual fear. Um, her parents still have to check her closets at night to make sure that there's nobody in there. Um, look under the beds, look you know, behind the doors. Um, she, <coughs> everything in her life is controlled by this fear that she has. That people won't like her, won't love her enough. She, you know, she has to make sure she gets really good grades in school so that her parents won't be disappointed. Um, she has to make sure that, you know, she's always doing the right thing so that nobody looks at her in a way that, that would make her feel unloved. And I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that, and especially to that degree. Um, and it's, it's almost sad, you know, it, to, to have to live in that state of emotion all the time. Um, and I, I can probably bet that we've all been in a state of fear at one point or another where we were afraid to move forward. And that's exactly what the disciples are like in the beginning of this passage. John tells us that they've locked themselves in a room out of fear. Now, they've been with Jesus for three years. Jesus has given them all of these teachings, all of this stuff to hang on to, and unfortunately, the disciples throughout the scripture are not always the brightest people. They don't quite get it when Jesus tells them. And it's not till later where he shows them exactly what he's talking about that they go, oh yeah, now I remember what he was talking about. Now that makes sense. And this is one of those times they've locked themselves in the room because they're afraid of what's going to happen next. They don't know how to move forward from here. Jesus is gone. They don't know what to do. And instead of remembering what Jesus taught them, they're stuck. They're hiding. As we go further into the story, we find Thomas. And I want you guys to forget all the, the stuff that you know about Thomas already. Um, the, the, the doubter. Um, that he's like the inferior disciple. Um, and that Jesus rebukes him at the end of the, the passage here. Forget all of that stuff if you've ever been taught any of that stuff about Thomas. Because I want to give you a different perspective mm -hmm. on what Thomas is doing in this passage. And, and the way John writes it. And he tells us a little something different. Than, than all those other stories we've heard about Thomas in the past. First of all, Thomas is not described anywhere in John's Gospel as a doubter. In fact, he's more often described as the twin in John's Gospel. When Jesus decides to return to Jerusalem from Judea, it's Thomas who urges all the disciples to go with him even though they know that returning to Jerusalem is going to be certain death for Jesus. It's Thomas who says, no, we need to go so that we can die with him at that point. Thomas is the one encouraging all the others, not doubting what Jesus is telling them, but encouraging everybody to go further. Thomas is a realist. Only days before he saw Jesus get crucified. 
And when the statement of belief, or lack of belief, that they have seen the Lord, comes up, Thomas views it as skepticism. And I know, for me, I probably would have been the same way. You know, if, if everybody else saw him and I didn't, I would probably think on that realistic mindset and say, you know, that's great that you saw him, I'll believe it when I see him. It's kind of like the, a terminally ill patient who's come to accept that fate and somebody gives them news of a miracle cure. You view it with a realist skepticism. You want to see it and believe it for yourself. Oops, sorry. Um, when Thomas asks in his belief statement, saying that, you know, I'll believe it when I see it, he's asking for what the other disciples have already gotten. The other disciples, when they were in the room, they already saw Jesus. Jesus came to them and showed him the holes and showed him his side. Thomas is just asking for what the other disciples have already gotten. I don't know if it's a, a statement of disbelief or not, but Jesus, when he showed himself to the other disciples, it was only then that they rejoiced. And we're glad in the Lord. Thomas, he's just asking for the exact same thing. He's no worse than the other disciples. And, you know, perhaps we misunderstand the kind of faith that John's trying to teach us in this passage, too. Um, in Hebrews 11, 1, it tells us that faith, after all, isn't knowledge, but instead it's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. John doesn't assume that more faith means less questions. Um, forgive me if you were in the Bible study um, during Lent, but I need to recycle a story because it, it kind of goes with this passage. Um, I have a very good friend, an old friend that I haven't seen in a while, who called me a few weeks ago. And he said, you know, when we were growing up, I always saw you as a very logical person. You know, the, um, it was, you know, everything had its place and, and the scientific knowledge and the whole logic of all this. He said, I don't understand this church thing. How did that happen? He said, I, I grew up in the church and I, I walked away when I was a teenager um, because it didn't seem logical to me. And I didn't have the greatest of answers for him at the time. Um, I told him, you know, the, the best thing that I could think of for him to do is to start small. You know, and, and in the mornings when you get up, hit your knees and just say a little prayer. Um, doesn't have to be much. Doesn't have to be anything formal. Just, hey God, help me get through this day. And at night, do the same thing. Hit your knees. Be thankful for what you've got. And hopefully that started to get the ball rolling. Um, what we see in this passage is kind of the same thing. That doubt is that second part of our journey where our questions can lead us to more faith. You know, we ask, we ask God for little things and the more we see the little things start to happen, the larger our faith grows in what God can do. And, and as we start asking for, for bigger and greater things to happen, we see that experience with God grow and grow. Um, and I think that's what Thomas is doing in this passage, is it's not just a matter of doubt, but all the other disciples got that experience that Thomas did in the beginning. He didn't see it. He wasn't there. But when he got that experience, his skepticism turned into greater faith. And then, towards the end of that section, we see what some people call a rebuke of Thomas. But really, I don't think 
that that section was about Thomas at all. When Jesus tells Thomas, blessed are those who have seen, who have not seen, excuse me, and believed, I don't think he's talking about Thomas at all. Actually, I think because John is writing this so many years later, John is writing this to the first Christians, the early Christians in the first century. He's writing it to us today. Because we weren't there, we weren't in the room, we did not get to see Jesus come back and see the holes and see the side. We didn't get to experience Jesus coming into the room. And I think what John is trying to do in this passage is give us that faith to move forward. That we have not seen, but yet we still believe. And instead of a rebuke to Thomas, I think it's more of a blessing to all of us that Jesus has given us here in this passage. So from this point of view, Thomas is kind of like the model disciple in John's Gospel. And if not a model disciple, then at least he's a model of what a disciple should be. Um, this passage, when I first started reading it, it looked like it was broken up into three sections for me. Because first there was this, you know, the, the part in the upper room where they're hiding, or in the room that they're hiding in. And then this whole section about doubt with Thomas. And then those two little sentences on the end that John's kind of given a purpose statement of, of why he's writing this. Um, But I think what John, and, and this is part of that underlying writing that we don't always pick up on. I think what John is trying to do here is show us the journey of a disciple and how it starts out. And how we can grow as we, we continue to walk on our journey. You know, starting off in fear. And then moving maybe from that fear to our questions and our doubts. And then... John tells us in those last two lines, he says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. We didn't get to see any of that. And he doesn't tell us about all these other signs and miracles. And yet we're still blessed to believe in what John has written here. Thomas is a realist, and he counts the costs. And after encountering Jesus, with his realistic faith, his skepticism goes away. And that's John's hope for us in all of this, is that we can be like Thomas. That, yeah, maybe we start off in fear like all the disciples. Maybe we start questioning and doubting. The questioning and doubting doesn't take away from our faith. It actually helps us grow. And that by not having seen to believe that we can continue to grow in our faith. What happens to Thomas is exactly what John hopes that we will get from, from this writing. Um, so I ask you today, where are you hiding? What is it in your life that you've locked yourself away from? Where are your doubts? What are you afraid of? What are you questioning? Bring them all together. He's big enough and he's strong enough to handle all of our fears and all of our doubts and to help us grow and continue on our journey. Amen.